eyes look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace turn your eyes to the hillside where justice and mercy embrace there the sun Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. 
Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. First reading is taken from Genesis, chapter 17 reading verses 1 to 7 and 15 to 16. The lesson is titled, Circumcision, the Sign of the Covenant. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abram bowed down with his face touching the ground, and God said, I make this covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abraham, but Abraham, because I am making you the ancestor of many nations. I will give you many descendants, and some of them will be kings. You will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. God said to Abraham, You must no longer call your wife Sarai. From now on, her name is Sarah. I will bless her, and I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will become the mother of nations, and there will be kings among her descendants. Hear the word of the Lord. A reading from Psalm 22, verse 23 to 31. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise you. O praise the Lord, all you that fear him. Hold him in honor, O seed of Jacob, and let the seed of Israel stand in awe of him. For he has not despised nor abhorred the poor man in his misery, nor did he hide his face from him but heard him when he cried. From you springs my praise in the great congregation. I will pay my vows in the sight of all that fear you. The meek shall eat of the sacrificed and be satisfied. And those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May their hearts rejoice forever. Let all the ends of the earth remember and turn to the Lord. And let all the families of the nation worship before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall be ruler over the nations. How can those who sleep in the earth do him homage, or those that descend to the dust bow down before him? But he has saved my life for himself, and my posterity shall serve him. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The second reading is taken from the book of Romans, reading chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, 
I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but what but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 8, reading from the 31st verse. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord.
Let us pray. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a right spirit within me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In our Old Testament reading, we witness another long history of exchanges between God and Abram. Abram is the person that we know before he changed his name or God renamed him. Abram listens, he's receptive and humble as God makes his everlasting covenant. This covenant is a promise that he makes to Abram and Sarai, who were still childless. Now they will be the forerunners of multitudes of kings and nations. This is a spectacular promise given that Sarai and Abram are way beyond childbearing years. God gives Abram and Sarai new names and the names we are more familiar with, Abraham and Sarah. And this signifies their new role in being the ancestors of the multitudes of Yahweh as their God. So now there are many instances in Abraham's life of going off in his own direction and being influenced by fear or the desires of others. He also has an abiding faith in God and follows God's direction, even when that direction seems unlikely and even impossible. Abraham's faithfulness pales in comparison to God's generosity and grace. God, having reminded Abraham of his character and reiterated and reviewed and rehearsed his promises to Abraham, even having expanded on those promises to Abraham and having renamed him to emphasize the certainty of those promises, God now goes ahead and institutes yet one more action of assurance for Abraham. You see, God knows that Abraham's faith is wavering, it's floundering, and he wants to focus that faith squarely on him. So God opens by revealing his character. He says to him, Abraham, I am the one that you're trusting in, God Almighty. And then he reviews his promises because he knows that Abraham's faith will be strengthened by the word of his promises. God adds to confirm Abraham's faith as a sign of the covenant. Here God institutes what we normally call sacraments or ordinance. Now, we've seen covenant signs before in the book of Genesis, all the way back in Genesis chapter 6. We saw a covenant spoken explicitly. We saw a covenant sign spoken of in Genesis chapter 9. And before that, in Genesis 1 and 2, we saw a covenant described. And in Genesis 2, the tree of life, we saw a covenant sign exhibited. In Genesis chapter 12 and 15, we have a clearer example and expounding of the covenant than anywhere else that we have found before in the scriptures. Here in Genesis 17, we have a clear example of an explanation of a covenant sign. A clearer and more comprehensive presentation of what a covenant sign is and what it is for. Before God gives the sign, the sign is designed to remind Abraham to teach him or to mark or to seal his faith, to assure him that the sign is announced and God stresses to Abraham his obligations in the covenant of grace. Abraham's covenant obligations are held before his eyes. God says further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants throughout their generations. You see, as God does this with Abraham, we ourselves are taught an important truth, that the joyful, willing response of the believer to God's grace is to keep the covenant. And the fact that the covenant itself is gracious, God does not have to bless us. He does not have to redeem us. He does not have to do anything. He doesn't even have to show us his unmerited favor. He owes us nothing. And but despite our sins, despite our own deserving wrath, he graciously enters into a covenantal relationship with us because he loves us and wants to bless us. And as he does, a response is demanded. Have you ever known the juxtaposition of the words in verse 4 and in verse 9? God says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And then God begins a section in which he reiterates his promise to Abraham. 
beginning in verse 4 and running all the way down to verse 8. God begins with the words, as for me. In other words, he's saying, this, this is what I'm doing for you, Abraham. God further says, now for you, you shall keep my covenant. You see, God's promise begins with the words, as for me, and then Abraham's covenant obligations are stressed the words, as for you. So in that structure, in that phrase, we see the context of this gracious covenant, a covenant which God graciously enters into, a covenant which provides the basis for the grounds of this relationship. It's not that Abram's work gets him into this covenant with God. It's God's grace that draws Abraham into this covenant, a covenant, a binding relationship. And there is no such thing ultimately as a one-sided relationship. In verse 4, we read, as for me, this is my covenant with you. Now, we have the other side of the covenant announce the words, as for you, you must keep my covenant. This reveals the very nature of the covenant, although it may seem one-sided in the sense that God sets up all the terms, but there are actually here two parties, as they are in every covenant. And here we learn God's grace demands a response, and that response always entails faith and commitment and obedience. And that is the appropriate response to God's grace in the covenant. And this sign, of course, does not bring about salvation. Paul makes that simply clear in Romans 4. Abraham was pronounced to be child of God, friend of God, in Genesis 15. And it said that God accepted his faith and contributed or counted him as righteous. And Paul goes on to make a very important point in Romans 4 that happened before the sign of circumcision was given to Abraham. See, the sign itself does not bring about the faith. The sign is designed to do what exactly? It is designed to strengthen a faith that is already there. I repeat, the sign is designed to strengthen a faith that is already here in us. The promise is given in the word of God. Faith is placed in that word. And then the sacrament comes along behind it and does what? Strengthen our belief in that word. So this is why the reformers say that the sacrament must never be administered apart from the word because the sacrament is simply a visible word, a visible, tangible representation of the promise of God. So in this case, a tangible representation which God carves into the flesh of Israel so that Abraham cannot walk anywhere without realizing that God had taken him for his own word and that God had promised him to bring from him a seed. And this sign is not simply a sign of national identity or Jewish ethnicity of interest into manhood. It is a confirmation, a confirmation of the promise of God to Abraham. You see, God created sacraments to strengthen faith. In verses 11 to 14, a description is given of that sign and a discussion is given of the consequences of that sign, of not keeping that sign. And again, we are reminded here that God created sacraments in order to strengthen our faith. A sacrament is an action designed by God to sign and seal us into a covenant reality. And that covenant reality is always communicated to us in the promises of the word of God. The weaknesses of our faith welcomes the sacrament. It welcomes the sign as an act of reassurance. So every time we see baptism being administered in the church, every time we partake in the Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper or the great um, feast, we are participating in a covenant sign. That sign is designed to remind us personally that we are heirs to the promises that God made to Abraham. And even better, he fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And that, people of God, is extraordinary.
이제는 There is a king seated among us and let every heart receive him now where there is praise he will inhabit there will be grace and mercy all around Every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. It's Jesus Christ, the King above. Our Savior face to face 